takes a toll on you mentally and physically, and it, it can be unsafe. But it's people out there that don't take the time to sit down and get to know somebody, you know, without saying, oh, they're homeless, they must be trash, or they must be junkies, or they must be alcoholics. According to the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness, as of January 2018, North Carolina had given an estimated 9,268 people experiencing homelessness on any given day. Of that total, 897 were family households, 884 were veterans, 478 were unaccompanied young adults ages 18 to 24, and 1,293 were individuals experiencing chronic homelessness. My name is Heath Burchett, the director and founder of a group that works with homeless communities called Watchmen of the Streets. The Watchmen of the Streets group is an outreach of a nonprofit called Habit Missions and currently serves in Charlotte, Winston-Salem, Hickory, Asheville, surrounding areas and throughout North Carolina. What a privilege it is to live in large growing cities and bustling towns throughout our beautiful state with so much to offer. Eateries, pubs, theaters, malls, parks, natural beauty, sports teams, and booming businesses. You get the point. But in the midst of nice things, luxury, entertainment, and convenience, there are so many lonely and dark places. There is a hidden world where many people facing homelessness are suffering in silence, behind malls, gas stations, amusement parks, or anywhere there are trees. Far back in the woods and away from the view of the public, people live in tents, under tarps, and under bridges. A shunned, hurting, and helpless society that often feels rejected, worthless, lonely and unloved. Mother Teresa once said, the most terrible poverty is loneliness and the feeling of being unloved. People everywhere are hungry for love. Let's start our time in Charlotte, North Carolina with my dear friend Ray. I have known Ray for around four years. He currently lives under this bridge and is a trustworthy, pleasant person to know. Ray serves others through our organization and through experience knows a lot about being homeless. Meet Ray. This is my house where I sleep at every night and I spend my days here. You know, it's, when I'm not at the library or something like that, this is my house. I, you know, I don't get cold or anything. I don't get wet. It's not the best place, but for right now, it's the only place I have right now to live at. And nobody misses with me. The, uh, the cops know I'm here and they don't miss with me. I keep it, you can see I keep it clean, but a lot of places they don't keep it clean. That's why they get run off but I don't get run off. I've been here for so long, they know I'm here, they don't miss with me. I experienced homeless probably 20 years ago, but it was off and on due to uh, medical with my back and I got anxiety and depression. But the past 10 years, is, it's been steady being homeless for the past 10 years. Day-to-day -day life right now, I would say just, it's actually boring. There's not much to do. I, I go to the library and read, or I'm down at the urban ministry, you know, taking a shower or doing laundry down at the urban. There's a place called the urban ministry where you can go take a shower, eat, do your laundry. I go there and then after that, go back to the library or I come back to the bridge. But other than that, it's pretty boring, if you ask me. 
takes a, it takes a toll on you mentally and physically, and it, it can be unsafe. You know, there are some people that don't like the homeless, and they might, you know, I haven't experienced that yet, but I've heard, heard people you know, talk about people being jumped because they were homeless. And that's, you know, somebody to do that, that's just, you know, you already have enough problems being homeless. You don't need something like that. Somebody trying to beat you up because you're homeless. You just, you know, I just can't understand why somebody would do something like that. You know, but, you know, they could be homeless the next day themselves. You know, people are putting the homeless down. Everybody thinks that being homeless is, you know, you got a drug problem or alcohol problem or you got mental problems. Yeah, they are, you know, I drink, but I really don't have a drinking problem. I drink, but it's not to excess. I don't do drugs, just what I take from my doctor. And it's, 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 it's an experience you won't never forget, as long as you live. Even if you get a place to stay, you always still remember being homeless for the rest of your life. I don't care what anybody says. You're not gonna not think about that anymore. Once you get a place or, or change your, your surroundings or whatever, you're still gonna be thinking about that. And I don't care what anybody says, you're still gonna have that. Just wants to scream. When I was first introduced into the hidden world of homeless camps, Deep into the woods of Charlotte, North Carolina in 2013, Ronnie was one of the first persons I had met. I met him at an amazing place called the Free Store. I was serving as a youth pastor at the time, and our group provided a Bible study and breakfast. Ronnie loves to play the guitar and used to enjoy coming to the Free Store in the mornings. Since then, we have become really good friends. Back in 2005, I was living in New Orleans, and uh, all that year was crazy. It was a bad year. Anyways, uh, Hurricane Katrina came. And uh, for those who know about Hurricane Katrina, when the levee broke, everything got flooded. I lost my truck, my music studio, uh, all my possessions. Uh, I really kind of never bounced back from there. Um, I was real into, in New Orleans, they're really heavy drinkers and partiers, and I was, uh, I was pretty much in the scene for like 10 years. And uh, because of alcohol, I, I lost my final job, went on the street, and uh, I guess I was drinking myself to death, so I came to Charlotte in 2000, well, it was nine, nine years ago, I think it was in 2011, I'd heard that Charlotte has a good base for helping people starting over and uh, so I did I got off the bus here with a backpack when I left New Orleans it was 71 degrees when I got here it was April 1st it was 31 degrees I was in shorts and no shirt oh, not a sh I had a shirt with a short sleeve slept on a bench the first night met somebody the next day pretty much went from uh, the bench to cardboard to a sleeping bag to a tent I did that for about three years. I got hooked up with King's Kitchen, which is an amazing, amazing place. And they have what they, they have a discipleship program that lasts a year. It comes with a job. You go to Bible study five days a week. You go to church on Sunday. You volunteer. And through that and completing that program, I have to do it twice because I got fired twice because I kept screwing up. But uh, finally, I, I got a place. I maintained that place for three years. I lost it again. Went back out, it was a year ago this month that I made a decision to quit drinking. I quit drinking for a while, but I, I was drinking vodka and I, I gave it up, I stopped. I went to detox, I had a friend help me get into a condo, I stayed for a while. And then, it was about eight months ago, I, I was working a full-time job, I was working 45, 50 hours a week, and uh, I ended up renting a motel room which was out of my price range. It was $1,000 a month. I was paying $200 a month to get back and forth to work. 
I lasted about nine months and I couldn't take it anymore because at the end of the day I didn't have any money. Hence the issue in, in Charlotte and North Carolina and around, around the United States is, is affordable housing. So I, I came back out here, I've been out here again, I think I'm going on month number three. And uh, I took about two months off just to get reacquainted with having to be back out here on the streets and stuff. And this past week, I just now started another full-time job. So I'm on that, I'm on that staircase trying to get back up one more time. And uh, it's a slow go, you know. I don't feel sorry for myself. As you can see, I got a beautiful spot, you know, it's safe. Um, I got a roof over my head where some people don't, you know. I got a little bit of money in my pocket so I can meet my needs. And, but, you know, I, I got goals and, you know, hopefully in the near future, I'll, I'll get all that back again. I got out of the Army in 2011, and I've been homeless ever since. I've been homeless eight years. Every time I get a job or try to keep a job, I, my anxiety put, put, puts me back in the place of being homeless. I met Joshua a couple of months ago. He, like all of us, has his own struggles, some as a result of his service. Joshua looked after me one day when we were visiting camps, and I slid down a muddy hill. I was in the United States Army, 3rd Infantry Division, 11th Bravo, 130 Infantry Regiment at Fort Stewart, Georgia. I served from 03 to 2011, eight years. And I got discharged for post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety attacks. And I'm supposed to be receiving a check every month that I do not get, but I have a lawyer looking into that. But I do get to go to the veteran clinic and get all my medicines and see a doctor for free. The veteran affairs really only have about enough resources to provide about half for all the veterans. So the other half is like me, they're out here living on the streets and not getting any help and stuff like that. Not all homeless people are drug addicts or alcoholics and stuff like that. Me personally, I only smoke cigarettes. I just have anxiety. and. When my anxiety is really bad, it, it keeps me from doing stuff like I used to before I got anxiety, before I went to war three times. I could work and live a normal life. Now my anxiety, it like makes me depressed and keeps me back from doing the things I like to do. The only thing I say, if you see a homeless person out there, because you're gonna see one in pretty much every state. I've been to 48 states. Florida's got, the, I think, the most homeless people because it's hot all year round, but when you look at a homeless person in need of help, don't always look at them like they're a drug addict or an alcoholic because not all homeless people are. Well, I mean, that's a hard question to answer, really, because if I had to say that in being truth, I feel like I've been homeless my whole life. About six years ago, uh, I don't even know how it happened, really. Uh, I was in Charlotte working for uh, Gaylor Electric, and uh, <clears throat> and the girlfriend I was with in Charlotte, she uh, she lived in Ballantyne. She had money, and uh, we were together for six years. But uh, I just couldn't, I guess, uh, do what she wanted me to do, which is quit drinking and quit drugging, because I like to drink and drug both. So I'll just go ahead and tell you I do. Uh, right now, I don't have any intentions of stopping. Uh, I like to smoke pot. I like to drink beer. Uh, that's mainly what I do. Um, it hasn't caused me some harm yet. But I'd say that's when I first become homeless. Um, and uh, I didn't know how to do this at first. I really didn't. I've learned from guys like my friend over here, No Start, uh, my girlfriend, Melissa Munsey. I've learned from my, my other, I've got a few close friends out here that are real close friends. I consider them brothers, not just friends. And uh, well, we are what, try to stay real out here. I, I've only had a couple places that were in my own name. Power Bill, my name, and all that stuff. Uh, that didn't last long. Uh, stableness has not been something I've ever known. That's okay, man. 
I'm going to be back. So. Well, I got to figure it out. I got to get my man's deal with Dan. You bring my stuff. I'll let you know when he's coming back. I was on social security income and it was canceled. Uh, lost my home, children, wife, all that good stuff. Had to come stay here. Uh, there was more resources here. Um, a lot easier to live rather than in a country town. But yeah, like I say, about five years ago. Normally go to Homeward Bound, probably get a shower. Uh, check in there because if you don't check in at least once a week then your housing goes back to the back of the list uh, I've been waiting four years so go there first thing pretty much every day uh, get a shower find a change of clothes because you know you can't wash clothes uh, I try to leave the ones I wore the day before there because they'll wash them and recycle them somebody else will get them I, I was fine until they took my social security I paid my bills on time I had a home I had a wife I had children I had a normal life just one unfortunate event caused five years of hell and that's what it is I mean it's hell you got to look over your shoulder everywhere you go. Everybody on the street. Kiss your face and then stab your back. You know, they, they lie, manipulate, steal. And that's the way they have to be because it's hard out here. You got to do what you got to do. It's a dog eat dog, you know. People are very judgmental of homeless people. I can't sit in front of a gas station for more than five minutes before someone's calling the police. I mean, literally, and I've got cerebral palsy. I got to sit, you know. Um, you walk around all day with a big camping pack on your back. You know, you got to pack everything up because people steal it. So you're walking around with tent, tarp, sleeping bag, all your clothes, cook stove, everything. And you walk around all day because you can't sit anywhere still. Most of the homeless people I've met out here are better than any of the people you'll meet in the world. They're the kindest people that get a shirt off their back. And that's why they don't got a lot because they're more willing to give to the point where they don't even have anything. And that's my fault, that's my problem too. You know, I, I go out here and make money and I give it all away. And then I, I'll be sitting there late at night like, oh God, I, I should have got something to eat. <laughs> you know, but I know my buddy's warm because I got him in that sleeping bag, you know, so it's all good. I mean, but yeah, just don't judge people, man. It's, it's wrong. This great love, love. Roughly about two years ago, uh, went through a divorce. And uh, so that left me out on to go defend for myself, uh, basically. And uh, at the time, I didn't uh, kind of bad and real heavy addiction. And so it wasn't something I just had the financial means of going and getting another place to stay. It's crazy, too. It's like a, a deer inside the city limits. They get adapted to what they're living around these cars and how I've got adapted to be kind of like right here. Uh, this is not, 
really, deep down, this is not really what I want to be doing at all. But I don't have the financial means to go rent a place in Asheville, in Buckham County, really. A thousand dollars a month rent. I don't even make that a month. How could I pay that and survive and eat and everything else? I can't get a job because I don't have actually my ID in my back pocket. I can't go back to a day labor company that I worked for for 10 years off and on because they signed a new policy saying you got to show your ID or driver license every time you, you sign over, you sign your tax papers. I, I feel sorry for the ones who has bad health problems that's out here. Literally, they're struggling. Uh, or don't have the means to buy their own medicine. Well, that's that's the people who has it really rough. Uh, fortunately, I'm at a place where uh, this place right here is on considered private land. This ain't state property. Now, you go on the other side of that fence, you'll be on state property. That means the yellow truck people can run you off. For us to get run off from here would be the owner of this land going to the APD and say, guys, we don't want nobody on our property. And they had to post up postage signs. And then they would arrest us for trespassing. Uh, but until they do that, we can't, basically we're, we're all gonna get run off from up here. You know, and I, I love convenience. I love going right down the hill and getting on the sidewalk and catching the bus. So like I was saying earlier, the homeless is, it's something that uh, is a 24 hour day job. It's either uh, you gotta get some water, you gotta uh, get this, prepare for this, wonder about uh, who's been up there and stole your stuff, uh, keep an eye on people. And guys, it's, in, it's got so bad anymore too. If you carry a backpack on your shoulders, people say, oh, he's homeless, he's homeless. Now, if we're going to a job interview and us three, go in there and I'm the only one carrying the backpack because I'm homeless and I, I got my most valuable possessions. The only way you know for sure nobody's going to tell you steal your stuff is you take it with you. You got to take your valuable possessions with you. If you don't, they might not be there when you get back. So literally that, ha that forces you to carry the backpack. But what today's society is because you got a backpack on your shoulders, they're going to judge you and I may say you're homeless, they're not going to give you a job in a lot of places. Uh, and people use that word homeless is that like, you're, oh, you're a bad, like you got, some, you're cursed or you're there to, to whatever. It's not like that. Some of the best people I met in my life has been homeless. And uh, this is the way it is. It actually started about two years ago uh, when we was uh, staying with our aunt and uncle in Monaco. And we had some disagreement and he kicked us out. So we thought we'd come here for help. And uh, from my other brother, and then it turned out he wouldn't help us. So we, we ended up getting stuck out here. So we've been out here for about two years. People assume that, well, homeless people are bad people, you know, we do nothing but Charles trouble, which is not the case. We're just trying to, you know, get out of this. So people like, all right, in our case too, like when we go for a job, they find out we're homeless, they ain't gonna hire us automatically. A lot of places won't. They won't even have anything to do with us. They get that misconception that we're bad people and that we do nothing but cause trouble. And that's not, all, that's not always the case. I know some good people around here that's homeless that you know ain't that ain't and they don't ain't like that. Have you they gotten a, uh, tried to get a job at Red Lobster down here? I, yeah. I don't y'all try to transfer back down? Anymore. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. But it was just something that happened so fast that you know yeah. I had to be back down here. But we're still gonna keep trying. We're still gonna get out here every day and bust our ass and try to get a job again. You know what I'm saying? Not 
and we're gonna stay out here and save our money until we can build it up and get you know another place yeah we have we have goals you know so that's what we're trying to do you do I don't know about y'all, but I do. I'm going somewhere. <laughs> I got a whole folder. See, the way we look at it, no matter what goes on that day, it's going to be a good day because God woke us up. How we originally became homeless, mine was bad choices. Mine was my ex that I was with for six and a half years. Every time that he would drink or whatever, get mad at somebody, he would come back to me and figure that was his punching bag. Me and him left Charlotte, went to Oklahoma City for two years, and ended up in Vegas in August of 2012. Met him in Vegas in October of 2012, but me and him didn't get together until April the 5th of 2013. Then we ended up in Charlotte, North Carolina, September the 8th of 2013, and we've been here in Charlotte ever since. He finds it hard sometimes to manage out here with his leukemia, which most people, they have it, it's, just, it's, in their, it's cancer of the blood. His is not only in his blood system, but it has also taken up residency in one of his lungs. Even though I don't have it, I wouldn't wish this on anybody. I mean, I don't care if you, you know, stay in a 400 a month rent one bedroom apartment, or if you live out in a 3.256 million mansion in Ballantyne. Nobody should have to go through chemotherapy and all that. That's hard enough to, you know, to begin with. It's then you get these stereotypes well, maybe if you weren't such a piece of crap and you weren't homeless, you know, all da da da, da you know. I mean, all I, I mean, I can't sit there and make people not want to stereotype people. I mean, but all I ask is that if you see somebody homeless before you, or residentially challenged, as we like to call ourselves, don't just sit there and turn around and walk away. Look at the person and be like, hey, look, you know, I've never talked to anybody before, but hey, you know, do you drink coffee? Let's go get coffee and get to know, you know, or are you hungry? I can bring you something to eat. A lot of people, oh, I'm not helping homeless because you know, they only want money. They only want money. Yeah, you do have a lot of, you know, some homeless people out there that are like that, but you also have people that live in houses that will sell their mama's cremated ashes to get alcohol or drugs. So people living in houses stereotype against homeless people when those who live in glass houses should not cast stones. When people ask me every day that what can we do why don't I, well, one guy asked me, why don't I get a job? And why don't I get an apartment? And, and, and why don't I do all the things that, that would consider me a normal, productive citizen of society? Well, what do you consider society? Because me being out here in the streets, society has forgotten about us. They have left us for dead. Society is all about that almighty dollar. Now, but if you really want to help, somebody out there might be listening that actually wants to help and find a true result to all of this madness and circumstance that Charlotte, North Carolina is being thrusted into, then I would say, my words to you would be, put on some just ordinary clothes, become an ordinary human, leave that professional CEO office, boardroom, conference room, and come out here and walk with me one night. And be homeless for one night. Because I've been homeless for about a year and a half, maybe two years now with no help, no place to go, nothing to eat, gotta walk 25 to 50 miles every day with blisters on your feet. Don't walk so far and it's so hot and so cold, you never know from one day to the next or one minute to the next if you're gonna make it to the next day. So for all of you out there who might wanna help, that might have the services and finances to maybe help the right way instead of donating it to a company and we won't see it, I say come out here and walk with us. 
and see firsthand. I like to call it the dark mile. Walk the dark mile with me one night and let me show you firsthand. We have all the security around us. We don't, we don't even need the city police. We got our own security because that's one thing I can also uh, uh, express to you about the homeless. We have a security perimeter too. We have people watching out for us too that protects us while we're trying to sleep at night. My Vietnam brothers, that the community services that helped us, that so-called helped us so much that public service don't know about. Vietnam vets, people who have protected you while you were sitting in those offices, they're still out here at night and they're still on guard. Come out here and walk with us and I'll show you firsthand, won't nothing happen to you because we got it like that out here. That's one thing we know about being homeless out here in the streets that you don't know that you put down on paper. That's just something you read, some documentation or whatever. You might've just jotted down to get the grant money for your next business. I know how it is, I understand. But if you want to learn firsthand exactly what you can do out here in the, in the community to really help those in need due to circumstance, whether it be drugs, alcohol, uh, a mother with three children homeless, disabled veteran that had two heart attacks and two strokes, can't find nowhere to live, thrust it into a shelter that he can no longer find a bed in, then come out here and walk with me, Sean Caldwell, homeless advocate. You'll be protected. I'll even show you where we eat, how we eat, where you take a bath at, when to take a bath, what hour to take a bath, and where you and where the, if there's any to take a bath. Come out here and I'll show you and put your money to use the right way, your labor to use the right way, your volunteer work to use the right way, instead of giving it to a company that might not even give it to us, the reason why we're still homeless and you're still living good. Come out here and live firsthand. That way when you put it down in the books, or you put it on the news or on a documentary, it'll be the truth. It won't be something you heard. My name is Sean Caldwell and I'm the homeless advocate. As Charlotte is looking for solutions to its affordable housing crisis, we're taking a hard look at the population that's at the bottom. Mecklenburg County has more than 1,400 homeless people. 15% live on the streets. There aren't enough services out there for people. There's so much need and a lot of the needs aren't met. There's a lot of criteria people have to fit. There's a lot of documentation. There's so much that goes into getting housing and getting off the streets that unless you have not just a social worker, but a team of people that love you and care for you and are advocating for you, a lot of times you're not gonna get housing um, just because the social workers are spread thin. The agencies are spread thin. I mean, the biggest issue right now I'm having with finding housing for people is that they get these vouchers, they're decent vouchers, but then you have to pay to apply um, to some of these apartment complexes and homes and the applications are $100. So when you don't have anything and you're applying at $100 and there's still that chance you're gonna be told no, they get you like into this like sunken system where we're wasting money, we're wasting efforts and at the same time people's morale's dropping because that makes you feel hopeless. Like you think you're almost in and then they're like, well, you didn't pass a background, and background's a really vague word, getting people housing. Background can mean you have a criminal history, it can mean your credit. There's so many variables to what background means, even if it's like employment. I don't think that they realize that there's some of them are one paycheck away from being exactly where we are. I know that, I, I sometimes laugh at it though because I'm out here, right? And I mean, I don't always dress like, you know, I try to dress where it looks like I'm not, but there are people that know, and then they have no idea that, maybe they know I sleep in a tent, they don't know I get up and go to work. You know, they, I think they, I think they, they put a, um, they stereotype us all in, in being the same. They're either drunk, they're on drugs, or all they want to do is party, and that's not the case. I know people, out, I know a person out here right now that, that is an RN and a nurse, but because they can't afford housing or because they're past Nobody let them have a place to live. They're forced to be out here. You know, it's it, it's not always a. Sometimes it's a choice. There are there are chronic homeless people who just don't want to help themselves and they want to stay here for because it's easy. You can find, you can become very complacent being out here because it's easy. You got nothing. You get all your needs met. What do you what do you need? 
I mean, but there are people out here that don't that don't have a choice, you know. And, and I feel like I feel like sometimes the cards are stacked against us for no other reason than affordable housing. That's my biggest bitch, if you want to say it, you know. They got all this money and 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 and, they, and all this empty buildings. They got all this stuff. I'm not saying I, I'm totally against taking somebody and putting them somewhere and letting them rent, live rent free. That's, that, that to me is crap. That doesn't help anybody. But how about for those of us like me that are really getting up every day and trying, working 45, 50 hours a week and needing, and needing a place and willing to pay. So that, that's, that, that twerks my insides, it really does. I wish, I wish, I hope somebody sees this. Who can make a decision? Who can allocate money to fix that situation? Because they've got it. Where the hell they do with all the money? They use it on themselves or there are people out here that are really trying. And I'm one of them. I don't want to be out here. You know? I make light of it and I have fun with it, but the reality is I want different. I don't like living in a tent. I want to, I want to get up and instead of walking outside peeing in the woods, I want to go to the bathroom, you know? And I can pay for it, but no one will help me. Sorry. It's bullshit and that's the way I feel because it can be fixed. The people that are wherever, who votes on that shit or whatever they do sit in their little offices, they can fix it, but they're not doing that. They'd rather build a shelter and stick everybody in it and just forget about them. So, that's the way I feel. Sorry. Relationships and the friendships that I have are are not with people in the street. They're with people like Life Connections. They're with people from a church. Um, they're people from work. Um, the people I, I try to I try to have relationships with people that have goals or, or at least are settled. Or, or I don't want to hang out with somebody who's gonna doesn't want to do anything because that's going to make me not want to do something. You are who you hang out with. You know, if, if, if you're a group of people who just wants to hang out and party all the time, you're never going to go anywhere. You're never going to do anything. But if you have established some relationships with people that can actually help you, or not even so much help you, but lift you up, tell you positive things like, hey, you're doing a good job, or hey, I'm proud of you for, you know, at least you're going to work, or, you know, you're not just sitting around getting drunk all the time, or building bonfires and singing Kumbaya. So I think relationships are important, but I think it depends on the kind of relationships. I have been um, with Watchmen of the Streets for just over four years now. Um, Keith Burchett invited me to uh, come out, uh, you know, just one night and kind of get the experience of it. And I immediately fell in love with just how compassionate the Watchmen team is and how uh, caring and how receiving um, a lot of our friends on the streets are. You know, going around to different camps, giving people stuff. They interact with the uh, homeless. They pray for them. But, you know, and they've helped me out tremendously. And I return, you know, volunteer twice a month, helping to uh, watch them to the street, going through the camps. 
giving out supplies and everything and talking to people. That's the main thing. I think they don't have nobody to talk, you know, outside of people being homeless. I don't think they have too many people where they could, you know, actually talk to about something. So we go out the first and third Tuesday of every month um, serving Charlotte and surrounding areas. Um, the vibe and the feeling that we get, uh, you know, watching our friends receive something, whether it be, uh, you know, toothpaste to a sleeping bag, pillows, tents, whatever it is that we may give out, um, you know, is a very special feeling. You know, you'll, you'll get a smile on their face. Um, from my experience, what I receive from it is a lot of the the one-on-one -on -one personalization, um, the hug, the handshake, um, you know, watching them smile as we approach them and making our presence known, um, and then you know them coming out in open arms is is the biggest thing uh, gratitude that that I can receive. Being able to help somebody in need in this area is probably one of the best things that you can do. Knowing that at any moment one of us could be put in that position, um, hearing the stories about their, their trials that they have faced and the circumstances that put them into homelessness is, you know, you can see the, the the fear and the, and the tears coming to their face when they express that. Um, so us being able to um, give a handout uh, or even just a compliment sometimes um, is, is amazing. And then we have friends that we're able to kind of help move into their new apartment that they've been, you know, waiting for uh, for a long time and, and on a waiting list, um, trying to get paperwork together, um, moving them four times from camp to camp, but, you know, finally being able to hand them the keys to their own place and walk them into the door of their own apartment. We can meet our friends on the, in their camps or on the streets and hand them tangible items uh, like a tent and ask them how their day was. and give them hope that there is something out there. We can pray with them, and a lot of them will actually pray for us, uh, for our safety and our well-being, as well as being able to continue to serve uh, you know, our God and, and love on them um, just as much as they love on us. Organizations like y'all are a really great thing for people like me. Like right now, I'm not out of job. I'm out of a job. Some people out here on the streets, they don't even have a tent, or they got a tent the door is ripped off of and they sleeping in it. So y'all help out a whole lot to people who are in need. I'm known. I'm known watching on the street for quite a while. They have. Uh, they have been there for me when no one else was. I remember a couple times when. <laughs> We were camping at some spot. There's this one spot we were camping at, and uh, we had a rat problem. <laughs> See, like every other week, I had big old holes in my tent, and that you know, there's watchmen. They'd always replace it, you know. And if it was cold, they would always. You guys, I guess I could say, you you always are there, you know, for a pair of shoes or a flashlight or something to nibble on in the middle of the night or something warm, a sleeping bag, you know, the basic necessities of, of, of being out here. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of watching the streets. They've, uh, they've been a friend of mine, no doubt. Mother Teresa once said, people everywhere are the same. They are all people to be loved. There are so many ways that we all can help. It could be as simple as shedding a smile to the next homeless person you cross paths with, or even going out and serving with Watchmen of the Streets. If you want to get involved or learn more about this, check out watchmenofthestreets.com. I challenge you to go out and see firsthand what people experiencing homelessness are going through every single day. After all, everyone in life 
Whether they be homeless or not, they are all hungry for love. Gazing on Back alive She wonders In a That's it. <laughs> That's it.